I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join us on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. I love gardening, but I'm kind of a messy gardener, to be honest. One thing that I came to understand is that if you plant sunflowers, they're just so extravagant and so beautiful and breathtaking that when anyone walks into your garden, including when I walk into my garden, I don't notice anything but the sunflowers. (laughs) It's just like, they're so beautiful. So they really cover a multitude of garden sins. If Lyanda Lynn Haupt is a messy gardener, it's because she has a lot of other things on her mind and more distant destinations to explore, far beyond the natural scenes of her yard alone. She's a naturalist, a writer, an earthbound, plant-savvy, animal-loving philosopher. Among her many books is the 2021 title, Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. With that word, crossroads, She's actually talking about the intersection not just of science, nature, and spirit, but the intersection of hope and danger, beauty and risk. If we are going to put ourselves in the path of wonder, then we're also putting ourselves in the path of the terror or the fear. And if we want to avoid the terror and the fear, then we won't be on the beautiful path. In this episode of Constant Wonder, a conversation with Lyanda Lynn Haupt that will touch on the fear and trepidation we often feel when we experience the immediacy of nature. We'll explore how our experience of wondrous beauty can entail inherent risk. Lyanda Lynn Haupt is well aware of this palpable tension. It's a feeling you can get in the presence of goldfinches or mergansers holding snakes or frogs, in the shadow of mountain or forest, in direct bodily contact with soil, meadow, or stone. The big question for us in this episode is simply, how comfortable are we, as the expression goes, in our own skin, when our skin comes into literal contact with the biosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere around us? What are we emotionally willing to brush up against, and for how long? in a wild world that we have neither domesticated nor subdued. We're going to get our toes wet in this topic, beginning with an encounter Lyanda had that by every measure will seem harmless or tame. It took place out in the garden she was just describing, a haphazard sort of impromptu patch of flowers. We've already foreshadowed this garden experience with the sound of goldfinch calls and songs. After propagating an explosion of color with sunflowers one year, she reaped a surprising harvest, including a magical, mysterious moment that left her in awe of what she calls wild knowing. It all happened because that year, anticipating an itinerary that would leave her far too busy for all the time that vegetable gardening demands, she quite nearly saturated the soil with sunflower seeds instead. I thought, I am going to create a sunflower forest. (laughs) And that's what I did. And I had the different kinds, you know, the teddy bear sunflowers that have all the little kind of ruffled petals. And then the ones that they rightly call mammoth sunflowers because they're much taller than me, which isn't actually that impressive because I'm not very tall. They're, they're just huge and their faces are just so wondrous and they curve in different ways. And then the ones that are different colors, the kind of rose colored and darker golden colored. And it's later summer. Sunflowers are grown. The sunflower seeds, you can see them They're Instead of just looking like a random middle of a flower, they're starting to look like actual sunflower seeds. And I was sitting on my back deck writing and From the sky, there dropped a goldfinch, vivid yellow goldfinch, and then another goldfinch, and then seven, and then 20, all within the space of just a few minutes. And they went to work eating the sunflowers. 
seeds in the mammoth sunflowers, starting with the big mammoth sunflowers. That moment in time is one that I had never conscientiously witnessed. I'd seen the goldfinches eating the sunflower seeds every year, but not the moment when they first just descended from the sky. And it hit me that somehow there must be a kind of knowing among them about this exact moment of ripeness because no one else had been to eat the seeds either. The chickadees, the squirrels, they are rampant eater of the seeds as well, but they hadn't shown up. So here is this wild knowing among the goldfinches of the moment between not quite ripe and just perfect. And it just struck me that this wild knowing was something that if I had access to it, I, I, I don't really pay attention to it. And I thought, here they are as kind of mediators between the seen and unseen. I, I didn't really know how to take it, but I know that I was delighted and kind of felt invited into the mystery of that moment. Something strikingly similar happened at the Smith home when my wife and I, uh, we bought our first home a decade or so ago. And we got some chickens, and one morning I was out and about, and I saw this ant hill. And from the ant hill started to emerge, well, all the ants with wings, right? And they, and they were taking flight. And, and some of the chickens came by and took some interest. They were hungry and started eating, and, and I didn't think anything of that. But then little by little, the sky began to just fill. Like your goldfinches descending, these were ascending ants going into the sky, uh, upward, upward, in, in, in masses. And within just a moment or two, in comes a dragonfly. And then two, and then ten, and then uh, by the dozens, the dragonflies. And I thought, how did they know? How did they even know to come? Uh, and I asked an entomologist once who studies dragonflies here at BYU at the university where I work. And, and uh, he said, they know. <laughs> I mean, he just, he just kind of left it there. So that's this wild knowing that we're speaking of. It's this, it's the same. And I love that your entomologist had to leave it in the realm of a certain kind of mystery because it's a kind of knowing that we're, well, I don't know. Are we privy to it? Can we cultivate it? Ever since watching those goldfinches that day, I've wanted to put myself in the path of that kind of knowing more and more. And just with the kind of moments that occurred just in these stories that we're sharing. I saw it as an invitation to just be more observant, to just see when I can witness that wild knowing and how I can more and more enter into it. And I think that there are stories within all of our lives where, where we can have those kinds of encounters if we are just open to them and we can't plan them, we can't find them, but I, I think we can be open to being present to them we can put ourselves into the path of possibility by maybe leaving our home or <laughs> going outdoors, I guess, for starters. Path of possibility. There's elegance in that phrase, and for me, there's something beckoning about it as well. Lyanda Lynn Haupt is describing the response many people have, the experiences many are inclined to pursue, when offered a chance to be in very close proximity to nature and with nature's wild knowing. What we encounter depends, naturally, on the relative safety or danger of the paths we explore, and we never know the end from the beginning. Watching the sudden arrival of goldfinches or dragonflies, that seems safe enough for the person who happens to be there at the right moment to witness it. But what if the path of possibility is more precarious? In a moment, we're going to walk with Lyanda along a path of exposure to possible harm in the Mount Rainier wilderness, far from the safety of her garden. To set the mood for that wilderness experience, I invited her to share with us a recurring dream she began having a few years ago. It was a dream that left quite an impression on her, and it had to do with taking paths of possibility, unknown paths in dark, forested places. Are you the kind of person who frequently dreams? I do frequently dream. And the more I pay attention to my dreams, the more, I won't say the more dreams that I have, because I don't think that's true. The people that study dreaming say that we're, we're always dreaming. But the more that I tend to them by trying to remember them, by perhaps recording them, 
the more aware I am of my night's dreaming. So what did you make of the idea that you would be in your dreams, in forests, on pathways, and moving through those woods, and finding smaller and smaller uh, forks in the road and, and moving down those? Well, you know, Marcus, one of the elements of that dream was what I was wearing in the dream. And that is what I focused on even more than the paths, because in the dreams, I was wearing a red hood. And it made me think of the myth of Little Red Riding Hood. And so that's actually where I focused my ponderings about that dream. I went to the library and I I got all the children's books about the tale of Little Red. And I went to the university library and got as many academic papers I could find that were unpacking the mythology of that tale. It's no wonder that I kept having that dream because by now at night I was putting myself to sleep looking over these books with all the different artists' versions of the tale. One of the things that I did besides all of that was find a knitting pattern that was called the Dragon Watcher's Hood and I knit it in red. (laughs) The pattern specifically said that you should tie a bell to the end of the point of the hood since it was a dragon watcher's hood and you don't want to be startling sleepy dragons. (laughs) Well, certainly not. (laughs) I thought that was really good advice. (laughs) But where that led me was just, it allowed me to sort of put myself into that tale really fully of wandering these paths. And the element of the story that started to draw me more and more was the wolf, the dragon in this story. The wolf in Jungian mythology is the predator, and the predator is the thing which lures us away from our highest good. A quick aside here, Lyanda is referencing Carl Jung and what has come to be known as Jungian mythology and Jungian psychology. This renowned Swiss psychologist had a thing or two to say about dreams. Dreams can be an avenue, he theorized, by which the subconscious sends messages to the conscious mind helping us process challenging issues that we perhaps are prone to sidestep during our waking hours. Jung's theorizing often focused on certain cross-cultural symbols and archetypes, among them the wolf, which, with all its scariness and danger, drew his particular attention. He held that a wolf showing up in a dream is a threat we will either engage or disengage with. What would Lyanda's choice be? And so in Jungian psychology, we learn to avoid that predator as part of our maturation. But I really read the tale a different way. And and this is where that dream ultimately led me to the idea that when we wander the woodland paths and we wander off perhaps the safe, well-trodden path, which is what Little Red was doing, and we meet the wolf, I think of what the wolf offered to Little Red. He said, you stay here and pick wildflowers. You know, he set her a task. So while she was doing that, he could run off and eat the grandmother. And I thought, how wonderful. Now, instead of just this basket of, you know, muffins that her mom made, Little Red is going to show up on her own terms with her basket of wildflowers that she collected herself on the path that she finds herself. This is a long-winded way of saying that what that dream invited me into is just a reaffirmation at this stage in my life of finding the, the path that is true to me and doing that through very literal walking on forest paths and finding the beauty and wildness there just from the ground up. At this point, you can essentially hear Lyanda saying that she's made her decision. Come what may, she's okay with doing what the wolf directs, lingering in the woods for the sake of those enticing flowers, all the while wearing her red hood. She's okay flouting the wisdom of her fairy tale mother by squandering time, dawdling in the woods. But... Something inside me is screaming, what about saving grandma? I'm the type to worry about grandma incessantly, even grandmas who aren't my own. And even aside from grandma being in danger, I'm perfectly capable about worrying just about me. 
basically, I'm a better safe than sorry in the woods type of person. I think Lyanda is probably more accepting of the wolf and flowers risk than I am. You've been known to go camping all on your own, solo, in places where there are living, breathing, eating wolves. Or at least you imagine them in your tent while, while you were going to sleep. This is on the slopes of Mount Rainier. You're solo. You're doing some alpine backpacking. So wolves were extirpated from Washington State in 1918. And although there are some sort of wandering back, they haven't returned to Mount Rainier yet, though there used to be great wolves there, and I hope there will be again. But what there were are black bears, cougars. Those are the things that I'm not really worried about black bears even usually, unless they're really acclimatized to human presence. They're pretty shy creatures. But mountain lions are a different story altogether. And then, Marcus, I'll tell you honestly, and I don't think I'm alone among women in this, the thing that I feared more than anything else was a man. <laughs> right. And even being that far out where the, the instance that you're talking about was one where I was so far away from humans, I didn't expect to see any, but that's probably the biggest fear, in the, even in the wilderness. Well, going back to Red Riding Hood on the, the forest path, I'm no interpreter of dreams, but you have had to grapple with fear and, uh, can I call it anxiety at the very least, but maybe out and out fear about everything connected with your attempts to be out on that pathway you were talking about. You said put, our, put ourselves on the pathway where we might see that wild knowing or the goldfinches or beauty or anything of awe and wonder. And to do that, you have to pay a price, it seems. Right. And, and I think you're absolutely right. You have to honor risk and also be in the path of a certain kind of fear. And anxiety is a little bit different. In the daytime, in the solo camping, when everything is ideally in the sunlight, I was going to say in the sun, because I'm looking out upon a sunny day right now as we speak, but the, it's the first sunny day in a long time. So here in the Pacific Northwest, you're just as likely to be in a gray and misty day, which is also beautiful in its own right. So when it's daylight, I don't really struggle with fear like most of us. It's when night falls and we lose our bearings and we can't necessarily attach sounds we hear to things that we see. And I would zip myself into my tent at night and just lie awake being scared of every little twig or breeze or I'd imagine I was hearing growling that was a mountain lion and you know I would get eaten and my parents would send out a search party and find nothing but my diary and some blood. You know, I just like, I would lie awake thinking these things. And I would think how stupid I was to go out there by myself. And that just to get myself from ever being in that situation again, maybe in the middle of the night, I would start packing my stuff and leave at the crack of dawn. And then without fail, what happens in the morning is that I would wake up, unzip the tent, and see the first light of dawn, see the mist rising over the lake. And in the story that you're referring to, this particular time on Mount Rainier, I looked out in the morning and I saw these mergansers, these hooded mergansers, a beautiful water bird floating on the lake with actual mist rising and their little baby merganserlets behind them. And then across the small alpine lake, there was a little herd of elk. Everything was forgotten in the morning. I thought, oh my goodness, this is so beautiful. How grateful I am to be here with the gift of solitude. How ridiculous I was to think of leaving. You know, what was wrong with me in the middle of the night? And then night would come again and the cycle would happen all over again. And I will tell you that in retrospect, I would not trade it. I would not trade it. What I did learn over time is that I could comfort myself in the fearful darkness and what Buddhist teacher Joan Halifax calls the fruitful darkness. I came to think of those as being twined together. But when I was really afraid in the night, I could think, okay, you've been through this before. You know how this goes. 
And it didn't make the fear go away, but it was still a source of comfort. Compounding this is the fact that you've never had very good night vision. Oh, that's right. And sometimes, yeah, I'll be driving with friends now or walking with friends. And I have to tell them, it's not because I'm getting old. <laughs> it's always been like this. I've never been able to see very well in the dark. That's true. You're listening to Constant Wonder. Lyanda Lynn Haupt is a naturalist, a writer, a gardener, and not infrequently a solo camper and hiker, all the real or imaginary risks notwithstanding. She's author of several books, including Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. I'd like you to take us to Minnesota. I believe this is up near the Boundary Waters, near the Canadian border. You're working as a young woman at an environmental learning center. Mm -hmm. And you determine that you want to do something to try to compensate for your your poor night vision, and you're going to practice. That leads to another, what could be a very fearful encounter. Uh, For me, it would be. I've been face-to-face with a moose before. I know the terror. I was working at the Environmental Learning Center, and it was way up at the edge of the Boundary Waters and and Quetico. For a Pacific Northwest girl, it was a remarkable landscape in that it's a calm landscape. One of the things we had at that ELC was a lake, Flathead Lake, and it had a trail that went all the way around it, a flat trail, maybe three feet wide, flat dirt trail. And I thought, this is the perfect place for me to become comfortable with the night and with my lack of night vision. I knew that I couldn't truly improve it. I don't think that there's a way to do that. But I could maybe, I hope, become more comfortable with it. And so I decided to do this experiment on myself, see how it went, where I would go out after dark and walk this trail every night. And I would wear moccasins on my feet so that I could feel the earth beneath my feet and learn from that and maybe kind of orient myself in that way. But I didn't take a flashlight and we didn't have cell phones then. I felt safe enough because there weren't many cougars there. There are wolves in northern Minnesota, but we weren't aware of any on the property. There were white-tailed deer and there were moose. And I also told my friends what I was doing. So they, you know, knew where I was and there weren't any cliffs I could fall off of or anything like that. So I felt okay about it. And like we we were talking about, there's a little bit of risk, but it seemed like a a worthwhile balance for me. So May I interrupt for just a moment? Because it's, it's one thing to be going out there and saying, I'm going to be more comfortable with the darkness, Mm -hmm. with my vision the way it is, with this trail. Uh, I'm just wondering if it was more than that, if you weren't encountering the wild because it was wild and because it wasn't, it wasn't safe. It wasn't fully safe. You know, I think as you say that, Marcus, there was definitely an intertwining of our metaphorical sense of darkness and the actual darkness. And I think you're right that my younger self was putting herself in the path of both of those things. I think you're right. It would be ignorant to not be cognizant of the ways in which what I was doing were potentially risky, potentially unsafe. And I think that fear can sometimes be an indicator of good common sense. (laughs) Sometimes the lack of fear is is really equated with a lack of common sense. You know, I've paired two stories here intentionally because one of them is the young Lyanda in her earliest years going around the lake in Minnesota. And then we were just talking about Mount Rainier and being terrified in the tent at night. And you just keep punishing yourself. <laughs> you know, I I just, it's so funny because I... Obviously, I was intentionally and continue to intentionally choose times of solitude in wild places. And I just, I don't think of it as punishing. I think of it as the most beautiful gift that I can offer myself. So I hadn't even thought of it in that way. I mean, I guess in the, in the moments, like I said, in the middle of the night, when I say, why am I doing this? I'm never doing this again. 
And then that just passes so quickly. So learning that lesson over and over again about that, the fear is just really an acknowledgement of vulnerability and giving up some of our protections is very powerful sometimes. So come face to face now with that moose at the Flathead Lake. Right. So so one night I was walking around the lake. Everything seemed to be going just normally. I was getting accustomed to walking in the dark. I was getting comfortable with it as I predicted I would. Part of that was just coming to know the trail really well with my moccasins, my feet kind of knowing where every root and stone was going to be and One night, I was quite near the lake, and I heard this big, like, kerplosh. It was just this really loud splashing sound. And in the lake, there's a giant, I mean, beavers are really huge, but we had a particularly large beaver who was blind in one eye, and I thought, oh, maybe that's him. And I thought, eh, he's not usually making that loud of a sound this late at night. And there were a lot of white-tailed deer around, and I thought that that's what it was. But soon, (laughs) I heard this... Again, this clump, clump, clump. And there in the in the night, I could see the shadow really close to me, just a few feet away of a moose. So the moose had no antlers. And at that time of year, I knew that was probably a female moose. And I thought, oh my goodness. Okay. I had learned about moose living on that land. And what all of the native Minnesotan people told me was that they're really unpredictable. You don't want to get too close to a moose. You don't want to, you know, take their seeming calm for granted. And if you see a moose, you should leave. But here I was in the night, and here was this moose. And I was so curious, like, what was going to happen next? The moose was just holding really still. And so my naturalist, the naturalist part of my mind and the moose curious part of my mind was thinking, wow, this is a rare opportunity to be in proximity to a moose in the beautiful darkness. You should stay. And then the rest of my brain was going, run, just leave. So in my brain, it was going, stay, run, stay, run. And as that was happening, the moose sort of determined what was going to happen next. She started painstakingly folding her legs under her body and descending to the earth. It took a long time. I I think of her as sort of kind of an elaborate cat sitting down and tucking her big knobby knees underneath her. And eventually she's sitting on, well, I think of it as lying on the ground, but you know what I mean, like resting on the ground with her head up. And I just thought, okay, well... If this moose, who clearly sees me, is just going to hang out, then I'm going to follow her guidance. So I took myself, and I also just very quietly, on the other side of the path, sunk to the ground. It was one of the most magical moments of my entire life. I'm sitting there in this beautiful, semi-moonlit night on the lake, with a moose and both of us are just sitting there quietly together and she has is you know long lashes like like a moth's antennas and she fluttered them down over her eyes and I can't honestly tell you how long I was there but I'm gonna say at least 20 minutes and possibly more and I just sat there drinking in that rare gorgeous moment until I got so cold that I was shivering. And I got up and it seemed in the moment somehow impolite of me to cross in front of her. And so I just stepped back and I went back quietly the way that I had come. How, how far were your noses apart? Our noses were five feet apart, maybe six. It's been years since this happened. Yes. But relive it for me. What was going through your mind once you had settled down The moose had settled down before you. You had made the decision to stay. There you are in the presence of this majestic creature. What's going through your mind? That is a very interesting question. For the first few minutes, my heart was really pounding. I was thinking about how stupid I was and for a minute. But that really dissipated when I saw the calm, still settledness of the moose. She was lying down. If she was going to, you know, it would take a lot of effort for her to want to run at me. That possibility of danger just seemed very, very remote. 
once we were both settled. I will throw in for any listeners that if you encounter a moose this closely, please turn around and walk away. <laughs> yeah, we need a disclaimer here. I don't it's want any lawsuits. Disclaimer. Please use your common sense, which in the first moments, at least when I when I didn't leave right away, I was I was not. I was kind of overwhelmed also. But the smart thing to do and the thing that I would advise all of us to do is to quietly take ourselves out of that proximity. And I also want to say further on the note of disclaimer is that my proximity to the moose was accidental. I would never have intentionally approached her that closely. Right. Um, I was standing on the trail and she came up to the edge of the trail in the, in the darkness. So all of the disclaimers. But once I was sitting there, my mind was very quiet. I don't remember thoughts going through my head other than the sense of incredible peace a sense of gift at being so near to this creature and for her allowing that nearness and for her choosing that nearness. It felt like a prayer. It just felt like a quiet, meditative peacefulness. My mind was not spinning after the first minute or two. It just rested in the sweetness and the silence and the darkness. The darkness, which is what allowed that encounter. This would not have been possible in the daylight. I have a story that will disrupt all that sweetness and the calmness. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's about 18 months ago. My son and I were up a, a western canyon here in town called Rock Canyon. How we, old is your son? Uh, he was, uh, at the time, 13. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been hiking up maybe a mile and a half or two, and it was time to come back home. It's just right on the outskirts of the city, actually, but it's very, it, it's fairly wild, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm talking to him about the podcast, Constant Wonder, that uh, here we are uh, talking on. And I'm explaining to him some of the philosophy of why are we doing this podcast anyway? Mm -hmm. And I start talking about awe and wonder and th then this word sublime. And I said, you know, people use that word sublime very uh, fast and loose because they think it just means a, su a superlative. It's just, it's wonderful. It's great. It's sublime. I said, actually, it has a, a different meaning historically where it's where there's dread and there's fear, there's horror involved in the sublime at times. And at the moment I was explaining that concept to him, at the very moment, he looks to my left and grabs me by the arm and says, Dad, and not six feet from him, oh, I'll give you seven or eight feet, uh, he, uh, out darts a, a bighorn sheep mm. that was bluff charging him. Wow. And and got so close to him that as the the this ram passed him and me, he could have reached out and, and swatted its rear. It was so close. And that was one of the best, worst moments of our lives. We were shaking. We were trembling. We were full of fear. We were exhilarated. Did I destroy your peace with the moose? No, no, not at all. Um. Because as I said, I mean, that that's how it started out. I was terrified of the moose and I just sort of thought, okay, what's going to happen now? And rode that sort of medial time into what became calm, but didn't necessarily have to end that way. And you, you know, what you describe, I'm thinking there's that Greek concept of Danos, the terrible wonder, which speaks to the way that you're describing the sense of the sublime and it seems like we can't meaningfully, I mean, in these stories that you and I are telling, it's hard to separate them out meaningfully, right? And if we are going to put ourselves in the path of the wonder or the beauty, then we're also putting ourselves in the path of the terror or the fear. And if we want to avoid the terror and the fear, then we won't be on the beautiful path, literally. It, that's what we're talking about, actual pathways. And that seems like a hard trade-off to make, one that I'm not willing to make. There was a time in the life of Lyanda when she was just a little girl and her idea of beauty and nature before she became uh, certified as a naturalist, um, your innocence of youth put you in a place that you called the Stream of Sparkling Stones. That was not <laughs> its real name. Where was that exactly? So I grew up in Kent, which is a town outside of Seattle. And in my backyard, there was a kind of a, a wooded ravine or a canyon. And in the bottom of that canyon, there was a stream. And it was actually called Mill Creek. I'm assuming sometime in history, there must have been a mill 
there's a lot of mill creeks in our nation. But I spent a lot of time down there and I would just bring my sketchbook. I love to draw and write, bring an apple and just hang out down there. Just, just out of reach of my mom calling me for dinner, plausibly. I could probably hear her. And if I was hungry, I would hear her. And if I <laughs> wanted to stay, I could, I had plausible deniability. Couldn't quite. And about it. how old are you at this time? Uh, about 10, you know, in that, that region of life, eight yeah. to 12, several years of my life that I was spending down, um, having, taking some solitude by the stream. I did have friends too. I don't want to sound like a super totally weird <laughs> introvert. I love to go hiking with my friends. I loved I loved hanging out with my friends when I was young. But I also have that introvert's need for solitude. And well, the reason I bring this particular venue up from early on in your life is because this is at a time when maybe you had a fairly naive view of how everything about nature would just be sweetness and light and wonderful and 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 harmless. And you were attending church at that stream, I understand, uh, informal church. Yeah, I would go and hang out by the stream and I started to see the frogs in the stream, because there were a lot more frogs than there are now back then. And I started to see them as, as my congregation. And I would just l- eventually kind of lie on my back there in sort of the muddy stream side. And you could enter, you know, even as a child, we enter into these sort of medial states of consciousness where, you know, the, the leaves are kind of twinkling overhead and there's dappled sunlight between them reaching to the forest or the woodland floor. And the frogs were so close. You know how they do that thing where they're just sort of suspended in the water with just their eyes over the top of the water. And what I learned is that I could reach behind them with my hand and just sort of slowly, slowly lift them up. I didn't know then what I know now, which is that frogs have very, very good eyesight. Um, They have actually the best night vision of any animal on earth. So they could see, and they also see things that move quickly, most readily, because they're looking for prey. So they're not as attuned to things moving really slowly. And although I didn't know that then, I learned by experimentation that if I just slowly slipped my hand under them and lift slowly from beneath that they would just rest quietly on my palm and I could feel that strange breathing they have with those kind of round cool bellies and I would transfer them to my own belly so I'm lying on my back by the stream scooping up frogs (laughs) putting them on my belly sort of having this moment of childhood prayer being a kind of weird spiritual kid in the woods and I started to think of it as my church my frog church Thanks for being with us today for Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. We're speaking with nature writer Lyanda Lynn Haupt with an eye towards some of the important themes from her book, Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. And in a moment, we'll also delve into her experience of living seven years with a starling. Before the end of this episode of Constant Wonder, Lyanda will take us to another venue far more famous than her private childhood stream of sparkling stones, as she called it. We'll visit a place she encountered as a grown-up, a destination that for thousands of tourists has evoked a sense of sublime fear or sacred mystery, awe mixed with dread, an ancient burial site in Ireland called Newgrange. First, though, I want to bring you another life-changing animal story from Lyanda. It's something highly unique she got to experience as she has made decisions all along the various paths of possibility. The wild creature that she, as a grown-up, brought into her home to live alongside her family was no belly-resting amphibian, although it could easily have learned how to croak like a frog. Carmen, a starling, was far more likely to perch on someone's shoulder— And while a starling is unlikely to elicit fear the way a moose in dark woods can, I think there's still something important to be gained from the wild knowing and at times simply from the alienating otherness of a bird dwelling under the family roof. (laughs) 
Several years ago, Lyandelin Haupt wrote a book titled Mozart's Starling. The book was about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's pet starling, which apparently made a real mark on the composer's life. While writing that book, Lyanda became aware of a nest of newly hatched starlings not far away from her home, all of which were about to be exterminated. In North America, starlings are a hyper-successful, invasive species and don't get much respect. Lyanda went to the nest, adopted a little member of the brood, and this little fledgling she named Carmen would figure into her background research for the book and the two became fast friends. In fact, this starling became a central figure in the household. She really turned everything upside down. I thought that she was just going to kind of affirm everything I knew about starlings being smart and being able to talk, which not everyone knows. They're mimics, they're gifted mimics, and they imitate other birds, music, environmental sounds, and human speech even better, or at least as well as parrots do. She meowed like our cat. Her first word was hi, the word that she most often heard us say to her. Her second word was Carmen, as in hi, Carmen. (laughs) I guess that's what we would say to her whenever we saw her. Her intelligence and her sweetness, I'm going to say, she was always wanting to be on us and with us and involved in whatever we were doing in a way that you could only refer to as friendliness really changed my perspective on, I mean, this is the most hated bird in the country. Not everyone knows that. They were introduced from Europe in the early 1900s, and then their numbers have grown so vastly. They are a threat to native birds. Conservationists hate them. They eat agricultural fields, so farmers hate them, and they're just considered to be generally pesty. So to see this really sublime, I'll use that word, composer, to be so inspired by this hated bird, and then to have this dear, smart, friendly creature in my household was just eye-opening. Would you share with us the anticipatory ability of a starling to to know what's going to happen before it happens and announce that the microwave is going to go off or that sort of a thing? (laughs) Okay, so this is something that it took me way too long to figure out, and I felt really stupid when I did. But one day when Carmen had been speaking for at least a year, she'd grown all the way up and she was developing her repertoire of mimic sounds, I came down the steps. I'm always the first one to get up. And I stepped into the room where her aviary is, and she came out of her aviary often and flew around the house freely, but for her safety, of course, at night, she would be closed in. So I I sneaked down, and she, in a whispered voice, said, Hi, Carmen, like I would when the house is asleep. And then my big tuxedo cat, Delilah, came down the stairs, and she looked at Delilah, and she said, Meow! (laughs) So now she's greeted us both in our own language without hearing anything. She just kind of knows what is to come. But then... I walked over to make my morning coffee. And just as I took the beans out of the cupboard, but before I put them in the grinder, she said, which is her pitch perfect imitation of the coffee grinder. It wasn't her most beautiful sound, but so she did that. And then when I walked over to put something in the microwave, after I opened and closed the door, but before I pushed the button, she again, pitch perfect, sang out, Beep, beep, beep. The exact pitch and rhythm of the microwave sound. And I just thought, oh my goodness, all this time I had been thinking of her as mimicking what was happening. And it took all of those things happening at once one morning for me to realize that she knew what was going to happen next. And she involved herself in this round of my life by anticipating it with her vocalizations. Like, hi, up, oh, time for the coffee grinder. Arr! That just, that was a game changer. And that is something that was little known in starling research. Because if you're researching starlings in a lab, you just don't have that 24-7 connection that it takes in order to start recognizing these patterns. Crazy. <laughs> If Carmen's most beautiful sound was not the coffee grinder, what was her most beautiful sound? Hmm, what was her most beautiful sound? 
there was a fountain outside her window and she would mimic sort of the murmuring of the water. It was still a little (laughs) bird-like, but it was also watery. And I thought that was a very, very sweet sound once I knew what it was, because she would make all these vocalizations that I knew she was, she'd work on it for a while. She'd practice her mimicry until she got it right. And sometimes if it was a natural sound or a household sound, for example, she would imitate the creak in our old wood floor, this kind of, she would be saying, (laughs) ee, every day. And I thought, what is she, what is that? I know it's not a starling sound. It's something she's heard. And then one day when I was walking past her aviary, I stepped on this part of our our oak floor and it went, ee, and then she said it again. And I thought, all right, there we go. So it was the same (laughs) thing with the murmuring water. I opened the the window, I heard the sound, and then I heard her start sort of gurgling along. It was the sweetest thing. What's the longevity of a starling typically in the wild? And how long did Carmen live in captivity? So Carmen died when she was seven years old, which is a good age for a starling. A starling in the wild can live up to six or seven years, but that would be an old starling in the wild. So four or five would be a good age for an adult starling. And as soon as she turned four, I just started worrying about her (laughs) almost every day. But starlings in captivity have lived to be 15 years. That's a, a number that's thrown out as sort of an outside outlier. That would be uncommon. And I was doing a reading once in the Bay Area, and there was a woman in the front row. And when I was reading a poem that Mozart had written for his starling, she started to cry. And I stopped and I, you know, checked in, see if she was okay. And she said, well, you know, I had a starling and he died a year ago. And I thought, wow, she's still crying about her starling after a year. That's sweet. And I asked her how, how old her starling was. And she said, he was 24 years old. <laughs> oh, my. Thought, oh my goodness. I thought, what have I done? I Do I have to provide for this starling in my will? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but Carmen had a good life and a seven is a good age. Yeah. I'd like to talk with you now for a little bit about a super memorable experience you had. This was in a place that was both earthy and unearthly. And it happens to involve putting your skin directly on soil. That's a a thing you advocate for frequently, barefootedness, along with wandering and solo wilderness and sometimes maybe being in moccasins, I guess. But it seems that your preference is to get as close as you can to the earth. Uh, One of the most wondrous, most awe-inspiring moments by your own admission in your whole life, was in Ireland, and you took your shoes off there. Would you take us to that anciently constructed mound in Ireland made out of heaped-up earth and stone, the place called Newgrange? So Newgrange is this huge, circular, low-to-the-ground stone megalithic site with graves in the interior. And I was so blessed to be there on a day that the sun was shining. So I was able to take off my shoes and walk the perimeter of the structure, incredible stone structure. And when I went into the interior, which you can only do with a guide, and I was a little bit worried, you know, some guides can be really chatty or they can just make lots of jokes and make your encounter with a deeply sacred place like that lose some of its weight. But again, I was blessed to have a wonderful guide. There were only about 10 of us allowed in at a time. And she prepared us to look at the very essential designs. We don't know what the purpose or the meaning of these etchings were, but there are these beautiful designs etched into the stone. There are spirals, zigzags, some triangles, some arrow-like symbols. And she, while telling us to be sure not to touch them with our hands, invited us to contemplate their meaning, but also said, and, and this was really significant to me, she guarded us against imposing our own sense of meaning or our own interpretation upon them. So we were allowed to take our shoes off before we went in. And there's a long, dark tunnel 
that leads you into a smaller, very cool, very dark space within. And she guided us there with her flashlight. We were not allowed to have our phones on or anything like that, any artificial light or sound. She guided us in with her flashlight while giving us just enough information. She was so respectful of the silence and sacredness of that place. And she turned off the flashlight and let us just dwell there in the darkness. And then she had some little switch that would activate a light that was outside that would show us how the interior temple would look. I call it a temple. The interior um, space would look on the winter solstice because like many of these beautiful ancient megalithic sites, it was oriented to astronomical events and to the seasons. And Newgrange is especially known for having this shaft of light shine right into the interior on the winter solstice. So I'm there with my bare feet. I'm there with all of these incredible etchings and the knowledge that they were 5,000 years old. And I could somehow feel just this whispering visceral presence of women that had gone before me in this place, birthing, laughing, grieving, dying, burying their children, their mothers. And I got really nauseous. It's so, so much spinning in my head that affected my stomach. And I just felt yeah, kind of dizzy and nauseating, but in a way that made it also feel very real and important. I learned that the people that lived there likely measured the places that they were constructing with their feet, with their steps. These places were measured step by step, foot by foot with bare feet. And I loved that idea that we are present to a place through that connection, the foot to earth, We make sense of that connection by our sense of touch, but our measurement foot comes from the human foot, right? So also that idea of locating our space or orienting ourselves in space from very ancient times by the measure of our footfalls. All of that was going through my head. (laughs) Given that touching the earth with bare feet is of importance to you, and that it seems to precipitate these kinds of encounters or experiences or proximity to to what is real, there will come a day when you die, you have a a plan for connecting with the earth in a really remarkable way. Tell us a little bit about your plans. We've been talking about green burial for a couple of decades, actually, in this country, and that's the idea that we forego embalming, which is very toxic to the earth. And we forgo the idea that we're put into a concrete vault so that we can never return, actually return to the soil as every other creature on the earth does. And we humans have for millennia. So there's a movement to counter that by having very simple caskets that are made of biodegradable materials, wood, wicker, and to not embalm our bodies so that we can return fruitfully to the earth. There's a new movement to take that even further, which is, so beyond green burial, it's natural burial, where you're also buried in such a way that instead of a a park-like lawn, maybe there's a green burial corner of a cemetery or there's a cemetery that's all green burial, but it still kind of looks like a traditional cemetery. These natural cemeteries are intact ecosystem. So maybe they're on hillsides with all of their trees. There's no grass. It's all just the natural soil and stones that are around. No human-made stone markers are allowed. So you can mark your grave with a, a natural stone and then burial locations are found later by your loved ones through GPS, which is kept on file by the cemetery. So that all sounded very elegant. And I knew that that is what I wanted to do. And I was sharing that with my family And the last thing I shared with them was that I wanted to be buried in a organic linen dress that was hand-stitched 
because also at these places you can be buried in whatever you want as long as it's absolutely biodegradable, absolutely natural, and even the thread has to be cotton. It can't be a polyester thread, anything like that. So I wanted mine to be hand-stitched. And my people started to look at me like I was absolutely crazy. And I thought, okay, <laughs> this is really unreasonable of me. Here I've got all these outlandish ideas already, and now I want a dress. How are they going to come up with this? And I said, don't worry, you guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it. I'm going to make it myself. And so I did. I got some organic linen. I got a flowing dress pattern. I stitched it by hand, partly during the pandemic when, you know, we all had extra time. And I love sewing. I love sewing by hand. And it was very calming to me. And I started taking it a step further by on the hem, I embroidered little quotes from poets in green organic embroidery thread. Our recent poet laureate, Joy Harjo, wrote, remember the earth whose skin you are. And that was one of the favorite things that I embroidered onto this dress. And sort of to get the dress infused with the right spirit, I started wearing the dress now and then on walks in the woods, sort of to get that remembrance to myself. I think it's, it's one that's important to me, at least, that death is where we're heading, right? And there's always that lesson of when you're in the woods, the leaves are returning to the soil and the soil is made up of, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, Western red cedars are decomposing beneath our feet. That cycle of life is is very present. And You're talking about humans and humus. I am, right. And, and humility. All the same root, yep, of the earth, of the ground. It's all one root. And so... I don't go around wearing my death dress, as my family calls it, (laughs) very often. But just now and then, maybe around Halloween, pull it out and get that Uh sort of connection. So the dress has poetry? Any pictures on it? Oh, not yet. That's sort of a sweet idea. There are a couple little leaves. Like I'll just embroider like a little like ferny sort of vine at the end of a quote. But... Hmm, what could I embroider? What pictures could I embroider? What do you think? It's a work in progress, and uh, a goldfinch might be nice, but no rattlesnakes, please. (laughs) Absolutely no rattlesnakes. (laughs) Or maybe I should, if I really want to confront these things, maybe that's what I should embroider onto my dress. But I probably won't, because it's not an animal native to where I live. Maybe a coyote curled up in her den. We'll see. Thanks for listening to Constant Wonder. Our guest has been Lyanda Lynn Haupt, a nature writer based in the Pacific Northwest. Her book, Rooted, concerns the matter of becoming grounded, rooted in life as as well as in death, eventually. The full title is Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. I'm Marcus Smith. This episode of Constant Wonder was produced by Eric Schultzka with help from Jenna McMartin, sound design by Mitchell Towsley, Dallin Jepson, and the BYU Radio sound design team. We hope you love what you're hearing on our show, and if you do, please leave us a helpful review or a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform and share this episode. It helps so much to get the word out. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.